Back in 2018, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google parent company Alphabet, sent a compelling message. At the time, the objective was not to motivate companies to gain a competitive advantage, but to prompt them to increase the security of information that are currently protected by a password. It has been assumed for 10 years that the uh, ability to break prime factorization, which is at the core of RSA, will allow this basically uh, store now and decrypt later, which is what people are doing to enable it. My guess is that's going to happen regardless of what we do. So I strongly would say to our audience that now is the time to change your encryption from the RSA standards from 30 years ago, and they did well for us, to new emerging NIST standards that are quantum essentially resistant. As far as we can tell, this, these new solutions, which are available now, are not breakable by quantum, uh, quant by quantum mechanisms. The reason you should act now, for example, is because we know that foreign powers, and I won't go into the details, are busy recording everything. And it is their plan 10 years, ago, 10 years from now to decrypt everything. And so I'd rather get the stuff encrypted now, stop the current mm -hmm. leakage, if you will, of future encrypted data. I'd like to get it fixed now. Back in 22, Arvind Krishna, the chairman and chief executive officer of IBM Corporation, surprised the audience and many viewers of this channel by asserting that we will have a quantum computing by 2025. Quantum supremacy sounds so scary. Commercial advantage. Yeah. I'll go to commercial advantage. Great. When will we have commercial advantage? 2025 would be my prediction. 2025? Not that far. A year later, again during Davos, the IBM CEO confirmed that IBM is respecting the timeline and we will have quantum computing by 2025. It will be powerful enough to create a major breakthrough in science, but also dangerous enough to make some of the worst fears come true. We sit on the timeline, so we're at 400 qubits today. That's on the cloud. You can go ahead and use it. By the way, a real quantum computer, not a simulation, not something virtual, a very real one. Wait, 400 qubits? Yes. That's, that's a big deal. 433 qubits today. Okay. 1,000 qubits, end of this year. And then multi- Explain to the audience what a thousand, not don't explain all uh, quantum physics works, because then we'll be here till tomorrow, but explain what 1,000 qubits means. Well, uh, you can solve problems in material sciences. Imagine lithium hydride for electric car batteries. Imagine fertilizers. There was a paper from China recently which said at 400 qubits, you could probably break today's encryption. I'm a little skeptical of the full validity of the paper, but okay, fine, 400, maybe 1,000. So that tells you that somewhere around 1,000, you're beginning to see problems being solved that you just couldn't imagine getting solved on what I would call classical computers. Quantum is not going to replace classical, just to be clear. You're not going to run your bank balance on a quantum computer, because a quantum computer may give you a different answer each time. For some things, you likely want the same answer. But <laughs> the physical world, materials, chemistry, encryption, uh, optimization problems, is what I believe we'll see some of them getting solved in this time frame. Koi Ito is the president of Keio University in Tokyo, but most of all, is a heavy user and expert on quantum computing. In a different panel, again during the World Economic Forum 2023, he confirms that quantum computing is advancing very fast. So basically, we, uh, we started using IBM quantum computer since uh, in 2018, five years ago, when they first introduced their IBM Q quantum computers on cloud. And the first IBM Q quantum computer we touched could only perform only one step of calculation. And we kind of went hopeless because that was really the first quantum computer we touched. We were excited that we, we were able to use the real quantum computer, but it was only one step of calculation. But then within two months after we complained or we suggested to make some um, improvements, <laughs> Uh, they I love that. <laughs> they, they introduced new quantum chip that allowed us to perform two steps of calculation. And we, be, I mean, double in two months, <laughs> right? We were so happy, in fact. And then, but that kept happening uh, for in every two months. So, so right now, after four years, quantum computer, by our sort of impression, is like kindergarten kids. So it can almost do everything 
but not at the scale, not at the level that we can do. But for example, uh, we work with eight companies at our KO University, three financial sectors, three banks. They came up with the idea. We want to find correlation between two pair of stock prices, stock share prices. For example, you know that when United Airlines stock share price goes up, it's likely that the Lufthansa uh, share price also goes up. But there are so many hidden correlation between pair of what you, you think would be the uncorrelated companies. But to find such hidden correlation, you have to try every pair, all the pairs, uh, which is just exponentially large number in the, in the real stock market. So today's computer, even today's supercomputer, cannot perform such large calculation. But we came up with this algorithm that will allow us to find such correlation, um, let's say, within five or 10 years uh, with, the, with the current expected growth of the uh, IBM quantum computer, we can probably outperform supercomputer within five or 10 years in finding such correlation. But such correlation exists not only in stock market, but if you have huge bio data, then you know, you, you will also want to find some correlation within such biodata so that you can actually discover, discover new science. So performing such incredible large number of calculation, which is not possible with supercomputer computer, can it make, you know, can be possible uh, by, 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 our, by our experience, by our experience of using real quantum computers. Not like you know, you know, uh, uh, making assumption on, on the desk on the white paper and pencil. But you know, we've been using real comp quantum computers, so we can really predict what will like to, what, what will be like in the near future. Um, quantum calculation of let's say molecules or chemical reaction that will be much later. Let's say in 20 years or so, or 15 years maybe. But we know that it will be possible, and we are, uh, we are developing algorithms with chemical companies. Also, Sony, Toyota, Hitachi are part of us. And we are developing, uh, let's say, handwriting uh, recognitions. Uh, and you know, if two handwritings are too, looks too similar, uh, then it is impossible to, to, to recognize differences. But, Quantum computing may be able to do that. And so, so we are developing all sorts of algorithms and preparing for the future that will be made by hardware companies like IQM and also IBM and other many uh, quantum computing companies. To add to the concern is the fact that some of the capabilities of a quantum computer can now be embedded in a GPU, therefore accessible to anybody with a fast home computer. Um, we have taken this quantum algorithm technology that we've developed and we've reworked it so that it can also run on GPUs. So this first, this next generation of products that I've described that we'll be launching over the next couple of months, we're not, we haven't gone public on this yet, but by the middle of the year, we will have, um, comfortably by the middle of the year, we will have availability for a, a chemistry simulation product and a machine learning product um that will be performance running on gpus so what is the solution emmy webb is a futurist and a prolific and successful author professor and a frequent speaker at technology events and she has the following suggestions you need to do long-range data-driven scenario planning because uh, there's no sense of urgency outside of the highly technical areas um, but this is going to be one of those things where there will be advancements and your organizations, whether you are a government official or you're an executive at a company, are going to be left behind. Failing to plan for the future is planning to fail. This is easier said than done. The panelist from KU University gave a more practical and quick solution, which probably didn't make some of the other panelists very happy. Take a listen. Don't listen to those who don't use real quantum computers. <laughs> those who do use quantum computers know how they are developing. 
So don't listen to those who don't use real quantum computers. What companies should start doing now is to invest in talents and start playing around with quantum computing. Recruiting talent can only get more difficult, not only because the competition for talents is part of the technology business, but also because the strategic importance of quantum technology is such that governments are introducing restrictions on the circulation of information, for example by restricting the exchange of international students. This is a common practice in the academic world and a source of talents to the industry. If we believe in this technology and the use cases, there will be a huge shortage in talent anyway, so we need them to train the people. Um, and then we can also do great science with the systems that we have. You need the skills, you need labor, and you need uh, energy. So in all these things we're describing, energy is not a real factor. It's going to be about skills and it's going to be about a desire. As for using a quantum computer instead, if a company wants to start practicing with one, there are already free options that are offered by the main players in the industry, including Xanadu, featured in a previous video, the link above.